you got your Bibles, I'll be reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 16. You can also follow along on the screen, but the screen won't be up there the whole time. It'll change. I'm going to start at verse 13. Instead of, yeah, I'm going to read to 28. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? The disciples said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then Jesus sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Coming at a turning point in the life of Christ from acceptance to betrayal, these verses have been an object of controversy through much of our church's history just this building's history. I'm talking the church. And I'm telling you why. Because they leave us with questions. Questions always cause controversy because everyone is of differing opinions. Okay? But the, some of the questions we're left with after reading this is, what is the foundation on which the church is built? That's a real good question. And what are the, these uh, keys of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus has handed over to Peter? And what are the denial of self and the taking up of one's cross, which Jesus said would enable a person to find themselves? Lots of discussion has gone on about this. When we look at the scripture, we see in Matthew's record, after Peter's affirmation of who Christ is, Jesus calls Peter blessed. Right? So far. And he calls him that because God had revealed to Peter that answer. Peter didn't come up with it on himself. God had revealed it. Revealed Jesus' identity to Peter. And Jesus went on to say, on this rock, I will build my church. And I have to tell you, there have been various interpretations of this statement and what it means. Some said that the rock on which the church was founded was Peter. The same Peter who in the next section, next paragraph, is telling Jesus to hush up and being called Satan. Now, others 
insisted that the name Peter, or Petros is what it was, all right, Petros, we just say Peter because we're American, all right, um, it means little stone, little stone. Have you all seen the stone that's the corner of this church building here? Is it a little stone? The one that's got uh, the year carved in it right out here. Have you seen it? Right. It's not a little stone. Yeah. Because, because the name Peter or Petros could hardly be identified as foundational rock. Still others argue that the church is founded on Peter's confession. On his confession. Okay? And because it is the confession of faith in Jesus, which Peter perfects, he says, you are the, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. No doubt in my mind. That faith is the church's foundation. And yet others have seen this as a reference to Jesus himself. All right? Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, is the foundation. Jesus is the cornerstone. And the epistles, the writings of Paul, of James, and Peter, and John, also affirm this. But in 1 Corinthians 3.11, the Apostle Paul states, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Christ himself. The Messiah, the Son of the living God, is the foundation of the church and the kingdom of heaven. So in taking that into account, that Jesus is the foundation, what about this gift when Jesus presents Peter with the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Does anyone remember when they were handed the keys to their first car? Anyone? Mine was a Datsun 510. All right. That's right. It had four speeds, and one of them was forward. All right. No AC, and I was in the desert. Yeah, that was a good time. Good times. Had both AM and FM. When I was handed those keys, I became the what? I became the owner of that car. Right? ownership of the kingdom of heaven is handed off as well. Keys. That's what it means to us. But Peter was also promised that whatever he binds on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever loosed you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But the keys can't be like the keys to the car, the keys to a house, the keys to the church building here because I carry those. What are these keys to the kingdom of heaven? What is this loosing and this binding type of authority that's given? Now, I have to tell you, I let you down on this one partly. After I was scouring through reference books and internet articles, I didn't find a definitive answer. I found a lot of answers from a variety of of people that I would read and respect their response about. But what I really found were disagreements. Someone would say, he said this, but that's totally wrong. I love it when people do that. They do that in blogs like nobody's business because they're not standing face to face. Christians disagree with Christians. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah. But what I found was, to some of these verses are clear evidence that the church, as made visible in the Roman Catholic Pope, is that the Pope is the holy man of Christ on earth. That's what one of them said. All right? And most hold that the power of making binding decision has been delegated to Peter and his successors. And if you understand the papal authority, uh, the Pope is a somehow descendant. They can trace it back all the way to Peter. I think they kind of make some of it up. All right, but they seem to do it. They seem to do it. All right. But I do want you to know that notion that the person who's in charge is the Pope 
came late in our church's history. And it came after the Bishop of Rome gained dominance over the other bishopsies and proclaimed it himself that he had that kind of authority, that he was God's man on earth. I guess if you're the boss and you say it, it's got to be right. <laughs> now others, other people, other than our, our Catholic friends, others that I found and noted that Peter was chosen by God to open the door of the gospel. To open the door of the gospel to each of the two major groups of mankind at that time. And friends, there were only two groups of mankind at that time. Jews and who? Gentiles. Gentiles. Where do we fall? Gentiles. We're Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. On the day of Pentecost, Peter gets out and encouraged by the Spirit falling upon him, preaches the first gospel sermon to Jews in Jerusalem. Later, God chose him to speak to Cornelius, the first Gentile to become part of the body of Christ. That's a key right there, isn't it? A doorway open to all of mankind to hear the gospel. But I do have to tell you, that's just history. It doesn't explain... Uh, that might to you and give some explanation of key, uh, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, to be able to preach the gospel to anyone without prejudice. Anyone. That's just history. It doesn't explain binding and loosening, does it? And that's a hard thing to grasp here. But one thing is clear in the New Testament. Jesus is the head over all things. He's ahead over all things for the church, which is his body. All right? So we're part of the body of Christ. Do we understand that? All right? I've been called a certain part of the body of Christ. It wasn't flattering, but that was not from a good, loving friend. All right? But, I, you know, I hope I'm a thumb. I hope I'm a thumb because it's opposable. <laughs> I like being opposable. Jesus is the head of all things. So all the signals come from the head, just like our head and brain starts off. Hey, foot, let's move. And it does. All right? So Jesus, in saying, I'm giving you the, the authority to bind and to loose things on earth as in heaven. He is not surrendering his position to any individual or group of men. Not at all. Because if we realize our direct link with Jesus as our head, then I believe we have a solution to the puzzle of what binding and loosening is. But that all begins, our understanding begins with another question. How do we on earth speak with such authority that we can bind or loose anything? How do we speak with authority? Well, the answer is that we on earth are, through Jesus' presence within us, the Holy Spirit, an extension of Christ himself. That's what we are. We're his representative here, right? We're his representative. Our head, who directs us through the, through act, act, the then acts through his body, the church, all right, on earth, to loose and bind authoritatively. And that sounds really cool, doesn't it? You know, we can pull her sometimes and say, oh yeah, I got that authority, you know. All right, he's had to walk around with my shoulders back all the time in uniform. Well, I had authority. I had stripes going all the way down to my elbow. I had authority. But with authority comes responsibility. Our responsibility to bind and loose on earth as it is in heaven comes with a commitment to the responsibility. It comes with the, the responsibility of being fully committed to Jesus. Do you hear me? If you're 
going to go around talking with any authority, you better be fully committed to Christ. Because we need to follow the Spirit's guidance more than our own. More than what we've learned all our life through the education system, through our upbringing, parents, all of this. we got to listen to the Holy Spirit more than any of that. Through the experience of a lifetime of living here on earth, we have to ignore that and follow the Spirit's guidance when it's upon us. If we're to have any authority, we have to show commitment. We have to show, show sacrifice of self, it says in our scripture today. We have to show obedience and we have to show penitence. When we're wrong, we got to say we're wrong and ask forgiveness. That's what that means. These are our calling. If we're to be known as Christians and followers of Jesus' Lordship. And that is the key. Whole obedience to Christ. The results, the results of obedience to Christ. Whole obedience. W-H-O-L-E. Whole obedience. When believers respond to Jesus' direction is that the attributes of the kingdom of heaven begin to be seen on earth. Attributes of the kingdom of heaven. Peace. Hope. Joy. Right? Restoration. Love. I'm talking real love. Attributes of heaven. When we we follow Jesus' direction. That's what occurs. That's what occurs when the church expresses its presence in a community. When we hide our presence and insulate ourselves from the world, we might have joy in here, but it does not go anywhere. We're called to express these attributes in our area, our community. In our scripture reading from Matthew, Jesus' response to the disciples' confession was pointed and it was striking. He confirmed their awareness that he was the Messiah and the Son of God, and he announced that his intention was to build on this reality a church. I'm going to go. He started telling them, I'm going to go. I'm going to go down to Jerusalem. They're going to say something about me. They're going to beat me. Hang me on a cross, I'm going to die, be buried three days, and rise again. And whenever I ascend, the church will be here. Church literally means a called out assembly. Or what Paul wrote, a called out people. In Brian's reading this morning. And this church is to be the lived out expression of heaven on earth. That was Jesus' full intent for this church to share the attributes of the kingdom of heaven wherever they are. Now I gotta tell you though, I also found in our reading this week a stern warning. A stern warning to each of us. Jesus warns us not to be casual with his name. Not to say Christian, I'm a Christian, casually. You better mean it. You better mean it. Don't say you're a Christian unless you're willing to live. Do you hear me? Don't announce yourself as a follower of Jesus if it can't be reflected in your life. If you're not reflecting Christ in your life, if other people aren't seeing more of Christ than of Tim or your own name, then it ain't working. And don't bear witness with your words that Christ is Lord if your habits won't witness to him also. If I just simply put this, walk the walk that you're going to talk. You hear me? Friends, in our relationship with Jesus, we are called to express the kingdom of heaven in our generations here and now. The destiny of the believer is to express the kingdom. 
I mean, we bind and loose. We affirm forgiveness of sin and its retention. And we speak God's word, not on our authority, but on the authority that Jesus shares with us as he shared it with these disciples that we read about, who he once sent out two by two. And the picture painted here in Matthew, it's an overwhelming one. It overwhelms me when I think of how I fall short of being like Christ. But friends, we are called to be the kingdom. We're called to be the kingdom of heaven here on earth to reflect Jesus in our world. That's what we're called to do. All right, don't be overwhelmed by it because greater things will we do because Christ is in us. To express him, his grace and his judgment, that's what we're called to do. And this is who we're called to be, friends. We're called to become that. This is who we are in Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.